Good evening. Welcome to Right Talk with Mike Lee. I have my guest here this evening is Charlotte Caples. I met Miss Caples some years ago. And she was being rowdy at a uh, family a family betterment conference of some sort. And she said something that almost knocked my boots off, really. The last few weeks I've been concentrating on uh, the plight of Rodney Reed, the, got the gentleman on death row who, thank God, got a stay that I predicted was coming anyway. But Miss um, Caples, I wanted to get her on the show years ago, actually, because I'm, I'm very interested in the topic in which she's an expert in, I believe. I saw her again recently, this Saturday, and uh, I said, what, what's, what's, happened, what's happening, Sean? I said, you come on the show now? She said, yes, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I said, what, what's going on? She said, I know she's all about, she said, I'm about equity. That's right. Tell us about equity. Because I know equity. nothing about it. Man. I don't know what my audience knows, but I don't know much, much about it. Racial equity, and I have to be intentional in saying the word racial equity, because um, a lot of times we use language and there's power in the words that we speak. So we really want to be clear to say what we mean. And so when I say racial equity, what I really mean is that one day, we will not be able to predict how well someone will do based on their race. Okay. Now, I think that uh, I just have a lot of questions about just a lot of things, you know, like, what is the goal? It's, um, I thought about friends of mine I know who happen to be white, and they say, I see you, I don't see color. I, I'm not gonna tell that lie. When mm -hmm. I see you, I see a woman with brown skin. I don't see one, I don't wanna see one that's pink. I don't see one with a tan. I don't see one with blonde hair. I see a woman with, with coarse hair and dark skin. As you so, so to say I don't see color would just be lying. And I just believe in truth. You know, I believe you just tell the truth. Yeah, that's one of those things. The concept of colorblindness is one of those things that we've been taught, we've been socialized to believe that if we say we don't see color, then ultimately we're saying that we're not racist or that we don't have the capacity to be racist. But truth be told is if you don't see the color of my skin and understand how I have to navigate the world because of the color of my skin, then you truly can't see me, the person. Well, to me, the, the, world, is, the world is different. Depend, the world, your world experience can be different depending on the color of your skin. That's just a fact of life. Definitely your experiences. And I, um, it's un maybe unfortunate that it's that way, but then what other way is it? I don't know of another way because I've been to America all my life. <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, all of us have been racialized. We've been given a category, placed in a category, and we've been given messages about what it means to be in those categories. You know, people really don't want to talk about race. Something, racism is something people don't want to talk about, really. And some people try to deny it exists. But it exists, and... To, to me, it's like in the game in the game of chess. You know, there's certain givens. Mm -hmm. No, in geometry, there's certain givens. In the game of chess, you know, certain moves, finite moves, can be made, and it's just something that one should, could take into account. Mm -hmm. That it, maybe it shouldn't be shouldn't be that way. But if that's the way it is, you have to deal with things the way they are, not the way you hope wish they would be. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. We do have to take into account the way things are as we navigate the world. But I also like to think that we can do things in a hopeful way, mm -hmm. as in saying what they are or what, what we want them to be. Now, when you, you, when you told me Saturday you, you were about equity, you were saying racial equity? Mm -hmm. Now, I hear that you hear the term racism, bias, prejudice, and all that. I think people... I hear people say, he said a racist statement. Well, you know, to me, to me that's said for effect. I think they get the terms mixed up. Can, how can, you, can you clarify that for me? Sure, um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right in that people use the terms interchangeably and also the idea that we shouldn't talk about race. And that has been, that's something that's been given to us to keep us from coming together, a way of social control, perhaps. Um, the fact that we don't have a common definition for words that we just use, and we use them in whatever context we, the individual, think they fit, versus having clear meaning and definition for them. If I were to ask you what's a noun, 
your definition would be? It's a person, place, or thing. And everybody else out there would recite that because we learned that when? Grade school. Absolutely. Some people didn't learn it in ninth grade, but I learned it before <laughs> that. But. Right. But the idea <laughs> that we can learn, we were taught some things, but we're not taught other things. And so it's not unintentional that we don't have a common definition for racism, that we are not clear about what it means when we say prejudice, and more specifically racial prejudice and bias. We use the words interchangeably. And even, I bet, if you look in the dictionary, um, the definition of racism would actually use all of those words to define racism. And so we as a society have been given um, an ambiguous definition so that we can never put our finger on it. Well, I, 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 hear, I sometimes hear people say, that's a racist statement. But as I understand it, my baby brother has a PhD in philosophy and adult education. He's a CD expert and all that good stuff. He says, Race, he says, by definition, black people can't be racist. Hmm. Because he explained to me that racism involves pre power and prejudice, not just a thought. Right. In, in other words, that you can affect someone's life yeah. by what you think and what you do. And I can't do that to a white person. Yeah. I like your I, brother. I don't think. Huh? I like your brother and his definition. <laughs> we could get along. No, this side told me. This side told me that. Yeah, yeah, I like my brother too. I wouldn't <laughs> trade him in for nothing. Good. I think he's confused when it comes to these sexually confused people. Who think they can be trees if they want to. Okay, I'm not going there. Why not? I don't know your brother that well. I just like his <laughs> definition of racism. And actually, I would say racial prejudice plus power mm -hmm. equals racism. Um, and that's a, that's a definition that's widely used in various systems to create clarity, to create common language. So when people do begin to talk and try to um, talk about racism, that they're actually talking about the same thing. I know that when I first moved, when I was going to, when I was first going to law school in Texas, I thought I was crazy. I said, man, the white people down. I said, these white people in this system? No, he said, uh, no, this is how they talk to me. Because uh, then my friends talk to me. They say, man, there's white people down. I say, they don't like black people down. I say, man, I don't like black people in Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> man, I say, I say, if you worry about, if you worry about racism, man, racism is from the Mexican border to the Canadian border, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and all points in between. Racism is the some, United States' some, greatest export. Some, some people will let you know, and others won't tell you. Mm -hmm. now, I got some videos that I want to show that kind of touch on kind of some kind of things I want to touch on, want to touch base with you. Okay. Okay? All right. Then we'll talk about those videos. I'm Ami Horowitz, and I'm here in Berkeley, California, to find out if voter ID laws suppress the black vote. Do you have an opinion on voter ID laws? Uh, yeah, they're usually pretty racist, and <laughs> they're, they're bad. I think voter ID laws are a way to perpetuate racism. Would you say they're, would you go as far as to say they're, they're, those laws are racist? For sure. Do you think it suppresses the uh, African American vote? Definitely. Uh, because they're less likely to have state IDs. Minority voters are less likely to have the kinds of IDs that have been um, described or required. These type of people don't live in areas with easy access to DMVs or other places where they can get identification. You can always get IDs um, you do over the internet. Does that also would make it difficult for, for black people in particular? Yeah, you have to have access to the internet. You have to be able to pay an internet service provider for certain fees. Do you think that's harder for black people to go online? Well, I feel like they don't have the knowledge of how of like how it works. Like, a lot of people have smartphones, but you might not have data. For most of the communities, they don't really know what is out there just because they're not aware or like right. they're not informed. I also think there's a repression of like black voting with um, how they, how if you're a convicted felon, like you're not allowed to vote and everything. And when you look at swing states like Florida, that's a huge population of the of the like African Americans. Now I'm here in East Harlem to ask Black people their thoughts on what you just heard. Do you have ID normally? You carry ID? Around? Yes, I have state ID. Do you carry ID? Yes, I do. Do you know anybody, who, any Black person who doesn't carry ID? No. 
everyone that I know has an ID. Why would they think we don't have ID? <laughs> That's a lie. Why would they say that? Do you have ID? Yes. Because I have my ID and my friends have their ID, so like, we know what we need to carry around. Yeah, everybody that I know have ID. Like, that's one of the things you need to walk around with New York with, uh, ID. Do you know any black adult who does not have ID? No, I don't. Is it a weird thing to even say that? Yes, it is. What is this, some, some type of uh, trick candy camera? I like know, that? right? <laughs> that's the only thing I brought with me. Those legit, yeah. legit IDs. I heard a lot also that uh, black people can't figure out how to get to the DMV. Really? Is that, is that, what does that say to you? I know it's that, it's on 25th Street. Do you know where the ID, the, the DMV is around you? It's on 125th Street and 3rd Avenue, I believe. You know where to get there? Yeah. Do you have a problem getting there if you have to get there? No. It's, I know these sound like silly questions. You know how to get the DMV? Of course. You know where it is? Yes. You can get there? Uh-huh. No problem? No problem. Just checking. Okay. And I also heard a lot that black people, especially poor black people, have no access to the internet, can't figure out how to use the internet. <laughs> yes. That's, a, that's just stupidity, honestly. Everybody has access to the internet. Even a little kid can figure out how to work the internet. I had access to the internet for years. You know how to use it properly, exactly. right? Exactly. I do it at work. So, of course, I know how to use it. Smart. My kids know how to use it. They all have iPads, iPods, whatever. Your phone has data? Mm -hmm. You can actually unlimited. Internet. Unlimited data. Mm -hmm. I use my phone as a hotspot. What does that say to you for the people who have this perception of black people? Um, uh, they're pretty much ignorant now. That's what my thought process on. I just think that's ignorant. 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 That's the very, word I hear very a lot. Ignorant. ignorant. Very, very ignorant. Does it sound racist for somebody to say that? I, I think it is a little racist because you know you're putting um, people in a category and you have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe a little bit of racist in it, but like I said, I think it's more stupidity and ignorance. You're judging somebody like, well, you're judging them because they're black, saying that they don't got it. What people are they talking to? <laughs> what are who are these people talking to? Do you have a problem that if you go to vote and they say, can we please see your ID to make sure you are who you say you are? Are you cool? Love showing my ID. You have no problem with that? Nope. Would you have a problem if when you go to vote, if they say, can we please just see your ID to make sure you are who you say you are? Do you have an issue with that? No. Would you have a problem if there was a rule where you have to show your ID in order to vote? I don't think so. No. Would you have an issue if there was a rule saying you got to show your ID before you vote? No. Nah. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Before you even start, I, I think you're trying to incite me. <laughs> incite you? Yes. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're just talking. It's all good. I'm just, I'm just, I just, when I see the videos like that, one, it, it shows me how much people are confused about just the idea of the term, the rate racism or racist. In this particular video, the, the thing that isn't being said is that there are some laws and processes, procedures in place that appear to be race neutral, the way they're written. However, when you use them in certain populations or as they get applied to certain populations, they have desperate outcomes, meaning that outcomes um, can be different based on who the rule is applied to. Absolutely. In some poor communities, there's limited access to internet. If I don't have enough money to pay all my bills all month, even though I have unlimited data, if I don't pay that bill, it gets cut off. And so the time that it's cut off, then I don't have access unless I go to some other means of employing that. And ultimately, in this video, we're really talking about poverty. Mm -hmm more so than race and it just happened and I can't remember whether or not the, the moderator in this video in, um, implied or actually said race in the beginning or if one of the um, first participants actually spoke to race versus poverty. I've had uh, many conversations with the pastor of my church, Brother Williams uh, at the East Side Church of Christ mm -hmm. and we've had discussions over the months I think uh, one of the central questions that we come down to is he says Michael how can a man think that he's better than you simply by virtue of the color of his skin I say to, now to me racism is just a form of an expression of ignorance because mm. to think you're better than me because of the color of your skin is ridiculous mm. because there have been people of talent who happen to be people of color 
there have been people in town who happen to be people not of color. So, you know, it's all over the place. God does whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, period. Well, it's interesting to even hear the conversation, and it reminds me of some thoughts of my mentors that we stay focused on, one, talk, having conversations without having common definition and speaking from the same context, and two, that we stay focused on individual racism that we don't actually move into the things that most impact us, and that is institutional racism and cultural racism. Racism, the messages we receive about racism, rather, will keep us disputing mm -hmm. between me and you about what you think and what I think versus looking at concrete numbers and how, no matter what system you look at in this country, there's a hierarchy in the outcomes. No matter what system it is, White people are on the top, black people are on the bottom, and everybody else get in where you fit in based on how the power structure needs you to identify. And it, until we move a conversation from blaming each other or disputing our different thoughts and start looking at the outcomes, because based on the color of our skin, you and I are gonna die sooner than some of our white counterparts. That's numbers. It ain't about how, what you eat or how you live your life, except that they may have something, some impact, but that too is based on our race. And so until we move the conversation from individualized behaviors into more systemic and cultural things, we'll be stuck. Well, what, what is the end goal? you think? Racial equity is the end goal. And what's that? Racial equity is that you won't be able to tell my outcomes simply by my race. You won't be able to look at a people and know that they're going to be on the bottom and they're going to fare worse in any system. So it becomes, an in, is, it, is it an individual thing or a group thing? It's a group thing when you talk about race. And we're talking about the, the social, legal, political construct of race in this country by which we were all categorized. You know, I, when I look at this country and, and its history, having uh, gone to college and law school and all that good stuff, whatever, whatever, whatever good that means, um, when you look at this country, this country is founded with the original, basically the sin of slavery. Period. It was built on slave backs. I mean, that's a fact. I don't think anyone would dispute that. Well, some people will dispute it. <clears throat> they think it was white ingenuity? <laughs> well, there was some white ingenuity that, in, that created the enslavement process, the chattel slavery process. Okay, that, that, was, that, was, an, that was an institutional and, and actually governmental thing because to me, when I looked at, now when I was in college, my understanding of the Three-Fifths Amendment was that it was um, an expression of the, your value. When the Three-Fifths Amendment was, I, I, I really had a mis, I really did not understand it until I had become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. When I understood that the Three-Fifths Amendment was actually a political mm -hmm. compromise, those gentlemen were more interested in establishing a nation than anything else. And they were trying to decide representation. Right. And the, the slave owners in the South wanted to count all of their slaves. Mm -hmm. But the people in the North who had no slaves would have been outnumbered. They would have had less power. Right. So the slaves, were going, power. the slaves were going to be used for the, for the South to have a little more political power than the North. Mm -hmm. And so I, beca I began to view the Three-Fifths Amendment not as a, um, a racial mm -hmm. thing as much as a political thing. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a political compromise they were trying, how are we going to count these people for purposes of voting? Well, it wasn't that they were going to get the vote. It was you, that. You're not going to count all five of yours. Because if you do, you, I, I, you, you, you will always have more power than me over here. Mm -hmm. So in, in order to make things equal, you just count three out of, you, for every five, five you count three. Mm -hmm. And that's, it was for purposes of enumeration. Mm -hmm. Now, some people interpret that as an expression of, of a humanity. And I don't know that that, 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 that that can necessarily be the case. Well, even at that point, at that point of the three-fifth compromise, 
black people weren't considered human anyway. Because you're talking about people who were not classified as humans, but were classified as property. They were, they were classified as property, and the people in the South who were slave owners want their property to, to be able to be counted right. for political and power purposes, right. but no for other purposes. Right. And they would have children with them and things like that, but uh, the people in the North didn't, didn't it was about it was a political, it was a political situation right. that they were trying to resolve. And I don't know that it, uh, I know that they would treat us, that we would treat as property. That's, that's what the um, Dred Scott decision was all about. Mm -hmm. But this country, I believe there are some good intentioned people who want to do what's right, but can't. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, and there's, for whatever reason, they don't have the wherewithal to muster up the strength to do what's right. They know what's right. And I believe that sometimes that is expressed and sometimes not. When I looked at the election of Obama, I didn't think a black man would be elected president of this country for 200 years at least. I thought I'd be pushing up daisies before that happened. And I, and I remember after the election of Obama, there were these articles that talked about a post-racial America and all this kind of stuff. Everybody was all huffy and puffy, all huffy happy in his stuff. And I think that was, in a sense, some folks, some white folks' way of trying to do, do it right, make it right, sort of, as much as they could. Hmm. But then, um, to me, when he got in office, I don't know that we, people of color, were his highest priority. Mm. And I didn't see that reflected in his policy. So it wouldn't be executive orders for, for reparations, executive orders for this, executive orders for that. I saw executive orders for bathrooms and all kind of things, but not us. So you want me to talk about President Obama? That's what you think you're going to get me to do? No, you talk about whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told you, see, you be trying to push my buttons. You already know how I feel about some kind of thing. So, yes. he know. In fact, he told me when I walked up to him this weekend, he was like, oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah. Tell the people what you said to me. Because you told me that, um, you, it's weird that, that the thing in the family thing you said, oh, President Obama ain't got no pop on. <laughs> and then when I saw you this weekend, I said, "Wait a minute, you didn't because you, I couldn't, I couldn't remember because I get you confused." There's another little short. And Austin seems to be having an overpopulation of short, smart black. You brand, getting off real. topic? See, anyway, I, I just confused something with somebody else. Short, short girl, and I said, "No, you're the one." You said Obama had no power. Then you explained to me that he had positional power, mm -hmm. but not real power. Right. And by that, I mean that um, he was elected into a position that we think is the highest position in this country. However, when you work inside of a system, you must maintain that system or that system is going to deal with you. And as the first black president of this country um, to come in and begin creating orders that would benefit you and me, him and his daughter, his family, he would automatically rece receive opposition. Opposition because he was um, perhaps righting a wrong, very much so. He was pigeonholed into a position where, or I won't say into a position, but his voice, he, he could not use his voice to the extent that white people can use their voice and say some of the things that they say when they hold positions of power. He would have long been dealt with had he, first thing he did was come in and started um, fixing some stuff the way that I personally believe that he knows needs to be fixed and is willing to fix, but has to be strategic about how he does things. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to pitch you anything. <laughs> Do you, do you think that equity is achievable? I absolutely believe it's achievable. And you know what I always think about? I always think about the, um, the bus boycotts in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I think about the people who, and we know that was a strategic um, plan to create um, economic, and, and economic voice, have voice through economics. Through money. Mm -hmm. that it was strategically planned and done. 
we get tired, but that was strategic. Um, but I think about the bus boycott and how when people were walking miles and miles to work, they weren't doing it for the next generation so their grandkids could see a better day. They were doing it for themselves. And if we had the urgency in organizing to achieve racial equity, if we had that kind of urgency, we would see some collective organizing where it's not just you over there doing what you do and me over here doing what I do, but that we will actually come together and bring our voices together and organize so that both of us can see some difference. But first of all, we got to be on the same page. We got to have the same <laughs> definitions. We have to... We have to understand, and, and it doesn't mean that we have to be in the exact same place because all of us are on our racial equity journey. We're in different places. We have different experiences. And that journey changes day by day based on the things that we experience. And so the idea, I always think about it in a, as a marriage. And you're married. I'm not married. But somebody told me this once, that when you're married, the marriage is the highest priority not you the individual and her the individual, but that you uplift the marriage. And in the same vein, if we're organi organizing against racism, it's not your initiative or my initiative, but the anti-racism initiative that we've got to be committed to. You mentioned something before the show started about, uh, there's some, is this a workshop or meeting going on in Austin? You asked me. You asked if I had attended a meeting of some sort. Oh, I asked what you. Had mean? you been to the Undoing Racism workshop? You said it was a sponsor, somehow sponsored, supported by the City of Austin. Well, what, the City what, of what, Austin has what, gone through a process where they're hosting money has been allocated through the City of Austin for city employees, and they also organize with community, which is important. Community has to be at the table, but organize to get a common definition, a common language so that we can go back into the community and organize together. There's other organizations and other um, workshops as well. While the City of Austin's Equity Office is organizing or is organizing using Undoing Racism by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Is Brian, is it? Yeah, Brian. That's Brian Schindler. Oaks. Brian, Lee, Brian okay. Oaks and Kelly Coleman are in that department and they're wonderful staff. Um, but also you have the mayor rolled out the um, task force as well. And he brought in Glenn Singleton's group, which is a uh, Pacific Education Group, and they do a workshop called Beyond Diversity. And there are a number of organizations in Austin that are doing those workshops as well. And even with mentioning the two, you can see a divide. This mm -hmm. is the city of Austin. <coughs> now, both <coughs> workshops are excellent. Both workshops, um, most people think of them as one or the other, but they actually teach two separate things. And so most people need to have, or sh I would recommend have both. So they don't have a common, common language between themselves? They have, a, they have a common language, they have a different focus. They're teaching two different things. And, um, and if I can speak on behalf of either of the institutions, um, I would say that... Well, you've uh, interacted with both of them, right? Absolutely. You know more than me. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> well, well, I don't want to act like about, I'm about their that. spokesperson. Yeah, I understand is what that. I'm saying. Um, but the People's Institute works on establishing an institutional racism analysis, as does Beyond Diversity. Beyond Diversity's focus is um, they use an instrument called protocol that has the, that has the individual person always evaluating themselves and their behavior based on that protocol. And so there is more, in the earlier phases, more focus on people learning how to identify what's showing up in themselves. That aspect happens in the Undoing Racism workshop as, as well, but the greater emphasis is on how systems function to oppress poor communities. Okay. Well, what do you, <coughs> in Austin, Austin has this great reputation on the outside, but like on the inside, it doesn't seem to be what it's all cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. In that 
the black population is dwindling while the city is growing. We're, it's like the black population is being outsourced to Pflugerville or in, anywhere but Austin. Mm -hmm. It's not unique to Austin. Mm -hmm. It's not unique to Austin at all. It happens in every major city, every small city, and it's the concept of racism, specifically institutional racism. Here in Austin, I think um, the, the, and actually one of the speakers from Saturday's Black Male Summit actually said, um, he said that the greatest hail is the one that looks like heaven. <laughs> yeah. And so folks are yeah. flocking to yeah. Austin believing this message that it's the greatest place to live. Um, well, but getting here and experiencing it's, something completely it's, it's different. It's a mecca if you, ride a, if you want to ride a bicycle to work or ride a scooter. So I haven't seen many brothers and sisters riding scooters. I've seen a couple of them, but not a whole lot of them. Well, Austin has plenty of work to do. There's plenty of people here working on it. Of course, the more that um, join the journey and have, and I always say you have to be intentional. Sometimes we do some stuff, and we do some stuff not even being clear about the impact of what we do. And you mentioned intention earlier. We can have the greatest intention, but if we're not looking at the impact of what we're doing, then we are problematic. And so I always say that people have to be intentional about focusing on racial equity, focusing specifically on race if we want to see something different. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other isms. There's plenty of other isms, and all of them need work. Um, and, and in <laughs> that, we have to look at, even in those other isms, we have to look at how race intersects with those other isms as well. I know when I worked in fair housing, you had a nimbyism, not my backyardism. <laughs> that 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 was that was big there. But when I when I look at that, a lot of things. You know, I, I don't necessarily evaluate them in racial terms, but I look at what it is. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. I don't fool myself about what it is. And when I'm, as I practice law now, and mostly in San Marcos, I have cases where. Um, you know, it's been documented that the site, the site and release policy is, is operates one way with respect to white people and another way for, with respect to black people. Mm -hmm. And that comes down to really the individual officers and their training, whether or not they have any, any kind of training. Well, and I would actually say that even greater than focusing on the officers, uh -huh. I would have us look at the organizational culture. Because you're only going to behave how the organizational culture right. says you can. So if we, again, start to look at the positions or the people um, rather than looking at the way we say we're going to present ourselves as an organization, then we'll still get lost. Now my gripe is going to come, and I'm going to have to deal with it on an individual basis with each particular assistant district attorney, mm -hmm. is by prosecuting those kind of cases, you're furthering this stuff, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't do that. That's the most I can do. You shouldn't do that. that or they may not realize that they're doing it. They may not be looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. but, but they won't look at it that way if I don't say something. Well, absolutely, when you see wrong, well, I say absolutely when you see wrong, you should speak up, but you have to make a judgment, too about how you're going to disrupt the things that you see happening. I think our greatest challenge is sometimes recognizing how we show up and the impact of how we show up. And it takes work to, to begin to see yourself. Now, you know, one, th one thing that's always not bothered me, but when they say, um, I know on Facebook I challenged one of my law school, one of my college classmates who's a judge in Tennessee. And he said, um, I asked, I said, what is equality? What do you want, equal realities? Hmm. My reality probably can never be equal to another person's reality because our individual experiences are different. Mm -hmm. And so to me, to chase equality is, to, is to, to me, try to chase something that can't exist. How can equality exist if we're gifted, differently gifted? That's another one of those terms that we <coughs> often use interchangeably with equity. 
a lot of people will use the terminology equality. And for a long time, we were told or we, you know, we believe that equality is what was necessary. Thus, some of the civil rights right. um, arguments, we're striving for equality. Well, you know. <clears throat> I can give you a hundred dollars and keep a hundred dollars, but if your credit score is better than my credit score, you right. get a lot more with your hundred dollars right. than I can get with mine. And so the idea of equity is that you have what you need and I have what I need to for both of us to be fruitful. And that's we've got a that's a language thing. I don't know in a, in a cap in a capitalistic system. I believe that there'll probably always be a top and a bottom. That's Adam Smith. You have you have the people who produce, and the people who produce don't necessarily get the greatest benefit out of what's happening. Again, that's by design. This country was designed on have and have nots, and through our political legal process. We then created this buffer class in between the have and the have nots so that we could diffuse the numbers because what, 1%, less than 1% in this country are haves? I don't care. If you working, you will have not. But we don't see ourselves. You can as that. you can be working and have a half night. You be working. That's what I'm poor. saying. That's it. That's exactly it. But we. I remember the first time I came home from school and told my daddy something about us being in the middle class. He said, "Who told you that, baby?" <laughs> where they, where they come from? <laughs> he said, "Who told you that, baby?" And I, you know, I thought I had learned something, but he really was speaking to me about how, you know, you. It's designed for you not to have, but to believe you have. Mm -hmm. So then you further separate yourself from the collective so that you don't come together to uphold or hold other people accountable, the haves accountable. That's our history. That's the history of the United States. Who um, Bacon's Rebellion. You a lawyer, yeah. Mm -hmm. That legal history to say what was put in place and what was happening in this country, why things were put in place, that was the beginning of the middle class language. Well, I, um, it's always been interesting to me that we as a people sometimes tend to expect, well, you know, those who don't have, who are not in control, people, a culture disseminates that which is theirs. I wouldn't expect you, 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 it's like, so we expect the slave owners to look at, to, to highlight the slave situation. No, they're going to highlight their situation. Hmm. Meaning, say more. No, it, 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 it's, it's you, 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 you speak for yourself first, not for Is that others. what you were taught? No, that's the exactly. way it is. No, no, that's the way Were it is. you taught that, though? Is that what your parents told you as a child? Well, my parents told me, do your best. What did they say in regards of your family and your siblings? They said, look out for your, family. Look out for your brothers and sisters. That's right. And so when we move from, move from a collective mindset to an individual mindset, again, that's by design to split us off so that we don't come together. It's the messages we receive every day. This country, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What if you ain't got no boots? What you do? <laughs> and, and if have you ever tried to pull yourself up? By, it's impossible. Even those of us of color, even those of us of color, black people, there's somebody mm -hmm. who supported you going to law school. Nope. N no, somebody prayed for you. Yes. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. But nobody you. took those exams. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody they did not. Exams. It's not that they took those exams, but you had a support system. And if anything went wrong, no. they were going to love you through it. Yes. Yeah, but they were going to send you money. They might not have had money to send. And if I remember my grandmother, <laughs> I, I, I got blessed out. Because I knew my family did not have 
a lot of resources. Definitely, a lot, definitely, definitely not money. And Mama D, I was going off, going back to school in New Orleans one day. Mama D said, "Here, baby, get you some gas." And I was like, "No, ma'am, no, thank you. I'm your grandmama." You don't block my blessing when I try to get. She went in, and I was like, yes, ma'am. And I took that $10 and put it in my pocket because she was doing what she could. Mm -hmm. And so even we may not have realized, I definitely didn't at that time, that she was doing what she could, and she wanted to contribute in a way that she could contribute. But we, we're often taught and given messages that you move away from the hood. You get your degree, and you go to the suburbs and get you a nice house. The thing is, you, get, in that, fact, that, they that, say, that was, that was, baby, get your education and get out of here and make something of yourself. These are messages our people gave us about what it means to survive and do better. The truth of the matter is we were never stronger except when we were together and didn't have access to other systems because we depended well, that, that's, on each that's other. Like, that's like my neighborhood growing up. We were surround. We were surrounded. We were in an all black neighborhood. We were surrounded by almost all white neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and that all black neighborhood thrived in those days. Mm -hmm. And something but, but, happened to disempower them. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Urban renewal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Urban renewal. Gentrification. <laughs> no. Back well, then, well, urban, no. in my day, gentrification. Your day, urban renewal. White guilt, I called it. That's what I mm. called it when I went to college. That's what paid for college was white guilt. Hmm. Tell a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, I believe that uh, those of us who came out of school in the late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. there were private white schools that were seeking black students. Okay. And they were, like, paying full ways. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Mm-hmm. And in the late, late mid-70s, when I was going to law school, there were some private school law schools that were, some law schools were beginning to become more diverse, let's say. Now, it just so happens, law school, I went to, they didn't have an affirmative action program. They just, if you can cut the mustard, we'll let you, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with you. Right. But uh, that's, that's all it was. White but that guilt. was, a, that's I think. And I, well, think, I think white guilt has, have, has a lot to do with what we expect hmm. sometimes. Hmm. Because I, um, there was another clip I wanted to show, it's kind of short about uh, con black conservatives like me. I want to talk about this white guilt. And, no, no, and no. What, I, I are you saying <laughs> that you got resources because of white guilt? Is that what you're think, saying ultimately? We used to say in my in my college, man, we're, man, we're on the we're on the caboose of a gravy train, <laughs> because the gravy train the gravy train was going through in the uh, late '60s, early '70s after 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 they had the wars. They mm -hmm. called them the riots. Was the wars? When you have skirmishes break out in major cities, that's a war. That's what yeah. happens in a war. After the war, they let they they pump some money into the black community. Mm -hmm. And white institutions started recruiting black students. Is what happened. It was a brain drain, actually. The the the, bet, the better black students, instead of going to traditionally, yes. historically black college, they were going to going to white college. Like, yeah. I'm one of them. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and it was a brain drain because well, they had the money. Yes, and so. I will say there is nothing wrong with receiving services and programs. We need them. You need a college. We need them. However, when we talk about racism, we're not just talking about something that happened to black people and people of color. Racism happened to white people, too. And so the idea that there's white guilt, um, guilt is an emotion. So how does, how does racism impact white people? White people are just that. as dehumanized by racism as we are. How's that? Our, um, I believe, actually, and so my background is in mental health, and I always think about why is why are our suicide numbers for white men ages 40 to 55 as high as they are? What's going on in white America that people think that is so bad that we need to take our lives? 
and the idea that there's a um, there's an ideal that white people need mm-hmm. to live up to. And when you don't live up to it, yeah. it's a problem. And and as society society has said, you should be as a white person. In fact, the model of humanity. If you think about race constructed in this country, model of humanity. However, white people weren't always white. And so what did it take to get into some of these privileges, as we call them today? What happened to your families that allowed you to buy into whiteness that really stripped you of your humanity? But we don't talk about racism in that term, in that way. And until we do, then we will always believe that racism is a fight for people of color. Racism is a fight for all of us. But, but white people believe that it's about helping. Uh, you, people tell me, uh, talk about being an ally. <laughs> Can't be my ally. <laughs> you need to be fighting for yourself. Because you got messed up in this just like I did. And so the idea that we can be co-conspirators, absolutely I need to work with white organizers Mm -hmm. and believe that they are part of the solution as led by people of color. Because I think before this work, before we started, you said you can't dismantle something with the same thing that created it, the same thinking that created it. I don't think it's reasonable to expect it. I believe you. That someone who created this system is going to dismantle that system to help you. If it's helping them. Right. And especially if they don't want to say that it's helping them. And that leads back to the white guilt, the idea that they're, you're doing well in systems. Your children are graduating. You're going to college. You can afford, you know, cars, houses. You have history. All of these things are wonderful things that I wish I had. But if you don't like it. You have and, stuff, but you may not have you. That's exactly it. And that's the dehumanizing thing for white people. And so the idea that white people have to do work with white people, very much so. There's there's white pain that needs to be addressed, and we're not. White children aren't showing up at school shooting for no reason. Who's working with them, though? And so we've got white people have work that they have to do with people in their communities, in their families, as do people of color and ultimately we've got to come back we've got to heal and come together as healed people working together because if you don't address your stuff and you show up next to me this stuff is going to show up and disorganize what we're doing as a collective well to me the problem seems to be primarily and basically at the at a family level which is what kind of the conference i met you at their family crisis families in crisis it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, green, red, or yellow, but they're unfortunately overwhelmingly of color where family, a family crisis. Not necessarily. There's plenty of white family well, I know, crisis. I know, I know. We just don't talk about it. We don't, we, don't, we don't do studies on, in, we don't do studies on the west side. On, on, on this, on we the, talk about the crescent on this side. Uh-huh. But if you look at different things, there's going to be a crescent over there too perhaps if we actually did the research and looked at it. But we don't. It, that's that's not unique to Austin. That's everywhere. Well, it reminds me of at Saturday, Saturday at the at the conference. Mm-hmm. The guy said uh, we're seven percent of the population, mm-hmm. but they, but they, it's like when we cause ninety percent of problems. Mm-hmm. He was saying that um, although we're less than seven percent of black population in Austin, we represent forty nine percent of juvenile justice, or forty nine percent of child welfare. Mm-hmm. That is disparities. If we're less than seven percent in society in, in the city of Austin, we should be represented at less than seven percent in every system. And so we see a over. If all things, if all things were equal. Yeah, if you think numbers, if if it was about numbers, it would just equate to the that's the bell curve. Mm-hmm. If I remember my statistics right, <laughs> that's just <laughs> it. That you just. That it, it, it would equal out that way, but because we do things, um, our culture, the culture of our organizations ha- are racialized, um, 
oftentimes we will uh, we will we will over we will over police we will over um you know you name it for people of color and under police for white people i'm so amazed at how many times white people say how they got pulled over and that they were <laughs> high and drunk and everything else and never, never questioned get, and go home get get home safe. Yeah. It's under policing because they 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 then can have an accident and hurt themselves or someone else because they were under police. But See, all of us are sometimes racialized. they don't sometimes some white people don't, don't understand that their experience with law enforcement is different from ours. They do. Because it's foreign to them. Some of them do, and, 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 and not in comp- comparison to people of color, but they know that they're doing something wrong, uh-huh. but yet they don't get they're held gonna be, they're accountable gonna be They're going to be all right. <laughs> so they do understand. And it's not just police, because I'm not picking on the police, but that's every system. You think about child welfare. You, you name it. Loans. You name it. And, and I think it's all, not think, I know it's all because our systems were designed for white people to succeed. That was the purpose of them. We weren't even a part of those systems when they were created. So they're not broken. They're doing exactly what they were designed to do. So and is the answer to get rid of the system? No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I wouldn't, No. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've got to do some overhauling because when we open the doors, I say open the doors, but literally people fought, bled, and died to be a part of systems. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't change anything. The culture stayed the same. Mm-hmm. And so how then do we establish a culture within our systems and our organizations that are truly equitable, racially equitable, and racially inclusive? And, and, and those are buzzwords. People are using those D and I, D E I, D and I, you name it. But what does it really mean to have an organization where I can show up every day and just be? What does that mean? What does that even look like? Is there a space where you can just be, produce, but uh-huh. not have to change anything about yourself uh-huh. in order to be in that space? I think that I don't know that I don't know that equity is as you as you in, the, in an ideal sense is achievable because of the differences between humans. That's what that's what because we're all differently gifted. So if we're gifted differently gifted, is it reasonable to 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 expect equal outcomes? Mm-hmm. Not because equal, equitable. What will be the difference as you see? As a result of my coaching, mm-hmm. people develop their voice. They develop how they show up, how they present themselves in a way that gives them power. They feel free to use the power of their voice. In an environment, in an organization, if people feel free to show up and use their voice and all of the gifts that they have, the diversity, diversity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's only when we try to make someone's gift fit our peg versus having an environment where people's gifts can come to the table and transform the environment to be as good as it can be. That's what I do. My my <laughs> organizational culture, my organizational consulting is about developing environments mm-hmm. that produce racial equity, that are racially inclusive, so that we can have the best outcomes for the people that we serve and that we ourselves can be our best fruitful and productive can, can be the best. can be the best we we can be. That's right. Who do you know that can use my services? Probably anybody. <laughs> <laughs>